Welcome to today's edition of Florida Appeals Journal. I'm Jennifer Carroll. And today we're going to address a very recent case out of the Florida Supreme Court that deals primarily with the issue of preservation of error. Uh, that case is the Allison versus Willoughby. And that came out on November 2nd of this year. Uh, the Westlaw site, for those of you who want to look it up, is 2023 WL7203352. So that, that case uh, actually is very significant. You would think with preservation of error, there's been so many cases on it, right? Everybody knows what you have to do to preserve error for an appeal. But I guess it's really not that embedded in our jurisprudence because the Supreme Court, uh, our Florida Supreme Court chose to write a lengthy opinion uh, explaining exactly how it works. And it overturned the second district's ruling on how preservation of error works in that case. So I think it's worth a close look. Uh, it'll tell you the current status of preservation of error in Florida and how the appellate courts are gonna look at it. Now, in that case, personal injury case, simple facts, uh, dramatic facts, uh, plaintiff, Randy Willoughby, was badly injured in a car crash. Uh, he sued after the accident, uh, the defendant, Alberta Allison, uh, bringing a vicarious liability claim based on Allison's co-ownership of the other car. Uh, Willoughby also sued uh, his own uninsured motorist insurance carrier to recover uh, policy benefits and for statutory bad faith. Now, Willoughby and his insurer settled shortly before trial for $4 million. And the subsequent trial against Ellison resulted in a $30 million jury verdict for Willoughby. Willoughby then asked the trial court to set off the $4 million insurance settlement against the damage award, but the court, trial court denied the motion. So the Second District Court of Appeal affirmed the denial of the set-off request, and it also certified a two-part question to the Florida Supreme Court as one of great public importance. Is a settlement payment made by an uninsured motorist insurer to settle a first-party bad faith claim subject to set-off under Section 768.041, Print 2, or a collateral source within the meaning of Section 768.76. The second district answered no to both parts of the question, and, held, and they held that neither statute authorized a settlement in that case. The Florida Supreme Court determined that Ellison never did come right out and ask the trial court for a set-off under section 768.041 print two. Quote, that issue is therefore unavailable for appellate review. The second district should not have ruled on it and neither should we. So the Supreme Court ended up quashing that part of the second district's opinion uh, addressing that particular statute, 768.041 print two. Simply put, according to the Florida Supreme Court, trial attorneys have to state the specific legal ground for their argument in the trial court if they're going to preserve it for later review in the appellate court. The trial attorney cannot argue that a client is entitled to relief under one statute and then argue on appeal that the client is entitled to relief under a different statute. Reading the opinion closely reveals that the courts are going to take a very strict approach to preservation of error right now. In that case, when you read the, the second district and the Supreme Court opinion, you, you'll find that the second district is pretty lenient, pretty liberal on how they applied the preservation. Uh, but the Florida Supreme Court was not going to have any part of it. Now, what the Supreme Court cited the general test that we all know, the test that governs here is well established. The party seeking appellate review must show that it raised in the tribunal of first instance the, quote, specific legal ground upon which 
a claim is based. Now, it's, they said it's not, quote, it's not a magic words test, but the argument presented must be sufficiently specific to inform the trial judge of the issue to be decided. Appellate court's faithful enforcement of this preservation rule promotes accuracy, efficiency, and fairness in adjudication. And that's the rationale. So let's look closer at the facts uh, in the, the Allison case. Uh, the Supreme Court noted that the record showed that in the trial court, Allison did not seek a set off under 768.0412. Instead, she relied entirely on section 768.76. Uh, Allison had filed a pretrial motion to determine collateral source set off pursuant to Florida statute section 768.76. Allison made no argument about the other statute, 768.041.2. Supreme Court said that whether a setoff is available under section 768.0412 presents an issue distinct from the issue of whether a setoff is available under 768.76. And the Supreme Court recognized that both these statutes are substantively different. And that definitely factored into their decision. And in the second district, and, and I want to go into their rationale because I think this is used by, by several appellate courts. The second dif district acknowledged that, quote, Allison never specifically cited 768.0412 in the trial court, but it found the issue preserved for appellate review anyway. Uh, the district court just waved off. So the Supreme Court says just waved off Willoughby's preservation-based argument. This issue, and this is what the second district has said, this issue was thoroughly litigated in the trial court and both the parties in the trial court relied on case law analyzing set off of uninsured motorist settlements under both section 768.0412 and 768.761. The Supreme Court said, quote, we cannot agree that Ellison preserved the section 768.041.2 set off for appellate review. A trial court called upon to apply section 768.0412 and 768.76 would quickly see that such statute presents distinct issues of interpretation. If Ellison wanted the trial court to consider a set off under both statutes, she had the obligation to present both issues to the trial court. Allison did not do that. She relied entirely, entirely, mind you, on section 768.76. And the second district cited no authority, and we are aware of none, for the notion that the trial court's mere awareness of case law discuss, discussing section 768.0412 without any accompanying argument put that statute in play for preservation purposes. So, it, that opinion just came out in November is going to hold your feet to the fire when it comes to being able to preserve your arguments uh, for a public review. So I re highly recommend everyone being aware of that uh, before going into court. Now, the what remained of the, the question, and the Supreme Court rephrased it, and this is a certified issue, is a settlement payment made by an uninsured motorist insurer to settle a first-party bad faith claim, a collateral source within the meaning of section 768.762a. Supreme Court said no. The Supreme Court in the same case reaffirmed that an appellate court cannot rewrite a statute to further its purported intent. Uh, the court rejected the defense's argument that 768.76 should be quote, read broadly to allow the wrongdoer to be relieved of full responsibility for her wrongdoing whenever the plaintiff is alleged to have made a double recovery. So I would refer you to uh, the opinion as really a good discussion of many of collateral sources uh, in this context. Uh, the court stated that 768.761 mandates damage award reductions for sums that the plaintiff has received from, quote, collateral sources. And then the court recognizes that the statute, sub 2A, defines collateral sources in details. The trial court 
and denied set off in the case, the second district affirmed that decision and concluded that the bad faith damages portion of the settlement agreement did not meet the definition of collateral source in section 768.76282. a And the district court had reasoned that, quote, an extra contractual payment on a bad faith claim does not appear to meet this definition because it is not a payment of benefits. And Ellison argued to the Supreme Court that the second district's analysis was wrong for two reasons. Now, when doing this analysis, uh, this part of the case, the Supreme Court uh, also uh, went into its preservation of error uh, rationale and stated in a footnote, Ellison also asked us to conclude that the insurance settlement meets the collateral source definitions in section 768.762A3 and 2A4. Ellison did not present those arguments to the trial court and the second district's decision does not address them. We will limit our analysis and decision to what was both argued and passed on below. Court kept coming back to preservation and a strict, um, uh, and strict enforcement of preservation of error rule. Uh, now, Ellison had argued that the bad faith damages fit into the term benefits because they would not be available absent an underlying insurance contract. Supreme Court agreed with the second district on this point that bad faith damages are not, quote, benefits for purposes of the collateral source definition in section 768.76282. First party bad faith claims like Willoughby's are a creature of statute, not of the underlying insurance contract between the parties. So that's, I would recommend you review that part of the opinion it goes into a very detailed analysis um, of that whole issue uh, but the conclusion we do not think it would be reasonable to interpret the term benefits as encompassing a statutory penalty of this kind and the supreme court has previously characterized statutory bad faith damages as quote in substance a penalty and so they rejected Ellison's argument on that point. Um, so again, uh, I recommend you look at this recent case, Ellison v. Willoughby. It addresses preservation of error primarily and also interpretation and further explanation of the collateral source statute on 768. If you have any questions, uh, as always, let us know. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, thank you again for your time and attention to uh, the significant case. Hi, I'm Jennifer Carroll, and I want to thank you for watching our video. You can see more of our videos right here. Uh, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below so you won't miss a single one.